barbell squats are easily one of the most popular and beneficial exercises implemented for the development of strength and hypertrophy in the lower body. But what should you do if you are unable to perform squats secondary to pain? Should you stop squatting and rest completely? Or are there other options? Welcome to E3 Rehab. Dr. Tony Camella here, physical therapist. In today's video, I'm gonna provide some simple and practical solutions that you can utilize if you are someone who experiences either back, hip, or knee pain when performing squats. This video is gonna be broken down into three parts. In the first section, I'm going to break down the squat and discuss why everyone should not be squatting the same. In the second part, we're gonna review different barbell squat variations and how these can potentially alter stresses around the low back, hip, and knee joints. And then finally, I'm gonna provide you some modifications that you can implement immediately to hopefully allow you to continue to squat without any discomfort. But first, let's start it off with a review of the squat. Squats are a bilateral compound exercise which target three primary muscle groups, the quadriceps through knee extension and glutes and adductors through hip extension. Despite what you might think, squats are actually not that advantageous for targeting the hamstrings, as numerous studies have shown the hamstring muscles contribute minimally during the squat. Some of the more notable ones being by Kubo et al. in 2019, Vygotsky et al. in 2016, and Bryanton et al. in 2012. Another commonly held belief is that everyone should squat the same. Feet shoulder width apart, toes need to point straight ahead, chest needs to stay upright, and knees cannot go past the toes. These are a few examples of misguided coaching beliefs. The reality is, is that the squat pattern will vary person to person, and that there are multiple factors which contribute to your squat. Anthropometric factors or your individual measurements, such as shin, thigh, and torso length, will influence your squat. For example, a longer torso to thigh ratio, so a long torso and short thigh, will allow you to stay more upright during the squat while the opposite, a shorter torso and longer femur, will require you to adopt a more forward trunk lean. Hip anatomy is another consideration, especially as it relates to stance width. Non-modifiable factors of your hip anatomy, such as retroversion or antiversion or deep versus shallow hip sockets, will have an influence on your squat. Then there are modifiable factors to consider, such as joint range of motion and squat variation. Reduced movement in the ankle, or more specifically dorsiflexion, will limit how far your shin can translate forward. If you have less dorsiflexion, this can result in a more forward trunk lean during the squat. The squat also requires a certain degree of hip flexion and rotation. To achieve deeper squat positions, generally more hip flexion and rotation are required. With limitations in either, there's a potential that squat depth will be compromised. And finally, the variation you are performing will have an influence on your squat. When looking at the three major barbell squat variations, low bar back squat, high bar back squat, and front squat, the change in bar position and load alters the movement. On one end, we have the low bar back squat. This variation requires an increased trunk lean and more vertical shin position. And on the other end, we have the front squat, which requires you to stay more upright while increasing the forward angle of the shins. Then there's the high bar back squat, which falls somewhere in between. All of these play a role in how you execute the squat. They will influence your stance width, the amount of toe out or external rotation, torso lean, depth, shin angle, how far the knees go over the toes, and the list goes on. In summary, everyone will squat differently. Some of these factors cannot be changed, such as femur length or hip anatomy. But other factors are more modifiable and can influence the stresses placed around the low back, hip, and knee, depending on your individual needs. If we take a look again at the differences seen during the low bar, high bar, and front squat, each variation creates a subtle change in the torso and shin angle. When you adopt a more forward torso, like that seen in a low bar squat, this increases the moment arm at the hip and low back. And in contrast, a more upright torso and forward angled shin like that seen in a front squat, increases the moment arm around the knee. In other words, a longer moment arm, given the same weight, increases the stress and demand placed on the respective joints and muscles. 
So a low bar squat is more demanding on the hip and back region, and the front squat is more demanding on the knees. The increase in stress or demand placed around certain joints or muscles with a longer moment arm is not inherently bad or wrong. However, it is a consideration if you are someone experiencing pain in either of these areas during a given barbell squat variation. Generally, the goal when performing squats is to elicit a positive training response, meaning you are aiming to build strength or hypertrophy of the lower body. But when you experience pain, this can be hard to do. Oftentimes, you need to keep the exercise challenging, but minimize discomfort in a certain area. So in this next part, I'm gonna provide you with a long list of options that may allow you to continue performing barbell squats with less discomfort or find an appropriate alternative. First, you can look at changing the variation. If you're experiencing hip or low back discomfort, transitioning to a variation with a more upright torso, such as a front squat, can reduce the demand placed on these areas based on the change in moment arms that I discussed previously. And in contrast, if you're experiencing knee pain, transition to a low bar back squat allows you to keep the shin more vertical and utilize a more forward trunk lean. This reduces the demand at the knees and increases the effort at the hips. Next, we can look at easily adjusting parameters such as weight, speed, reps, frequency, and rest time. Let's take a look at weight first, since it's probably the most intuitive and it ties in with many of the other parameters. Reducing load can quickly reduce pain or make the exercise more tolerable, but it often comes at the expense of reducing the training stimulus. For certain injuries or surgeries, this might be required for a given duration of time. However, oftentimes we can also change tempo or reps to accommodate the reduction in weight to help create an appropriate training stimulus. By purposely slowing the speed of the movement, you are able to make lighter loads more challenging. While it may not allow for the same strength adaptations, it is still beneficial for hypertrophy and tendon rehab. An example would be written as 3-1-3-1, lowering for three seconds, pausing at the bottom for one second, taking three seconds to come back up, pausing at the top for one second, and then repeating for the desired sets and repetitions. Another option is adjusting the number of repetitions you perform. Weight and reps will have this inverse relationship, meaning the heavier the weight you use, the less reps you can perform, and the lighter weight you use, the more repetitions you can perform. So if it's the weight on the bar that is creating discomfort, you can consider lowering that weight and increasing the number of repetitions. For example, if you typically perform squats for three sets of four to six repetitions at 185 pounds, you can reduce weight to 135 pounds, but will need to increase repetitions to six to eight per set in order to keep the volume load similar. Now let's consider sets as an independent variable. Let's assume you perform four to six sets of squats in a single session. One option would be to distribute those sets across two days so you are only completing two to three sets each day. This would decrease the load on sensitive tissues within a single session while still optimizing training and maximizing recovery between workouts. And finally, the last parameter is your rest breaks. For example, if you currently rest 60 to 90 seconds between squat sets, consider increasing your rest time to anywhere from two to five minutes between sets. This focuses on minimizing fatigue between sets within a given session, which may decrease the likelihood of discomfort. If manipulating the other variables isn't sufficient, modifying the range of motion we move through, whether in isolation or conjunction, can be extremely beneficial. By utilizing a box or another surface and reducing the depth of your squat, you reduce the amount of knee flexion, hip flexion, and potentially lumbar flexion. More range of motion generally increases the demand in each of these regions, which is often advantageous for strength or hypertrophy, but it may be problematic when you're experiencing pain. The last factor to consider as it relates to the squat is technique. Now, as I mentioned earlier, not everyone will squat the same, and that's a good thing. The technique that you choose should be primarily based on optimizing two factors. That's performance and comfort. Don't take a one size fits all approach to your squat. It is perfectly acceptable to adjust your stance width and foot position to find out what works best for you. 
One factor you will want to keep consistent during the squat is the bar path. Ideally, you want the bar to travel in a relatively straight line up and down, with it generally staying over your midfoot throughout each repetition. If during the back squat, your bar path tends to move more forward in relation to the midfoot, this increases the moment arm to your low back and will increase the demand placed on it. To reduce this stress, dialing in a more optimal vertical bar path is a relatively simple and easy adjustment to make. The equipment you use can also modify technique and alter stresses. For example, heel lifts or weightlifting shoes will generally allow you to stay more upright, which may shift more load to your knees, which could be advantageous if you are experiencing hip or back discomfort. If adjusting these variables surrounding the barbell squat are unsuccessful and you are still experiencing pain or discomfort, we can look at making changes to exercise selection. Now, you perform squats because they target the quads, glutes, and adductors by moving the ankle, knee, and hip through a given range of motion. While split squats move these same joints through a similar range of motion and target the same muscles. However, you have more freedom to manipulate trunk and shin angles, increasing the chance you can find a more comfortable variation. For example, if your back or hip is painful with the squat, utilizing a more upright torso position during a split squat might be more comfortable. Or if your knee is achy or uncomfortable with squats, a split squat with a more vertical shin and an angled torso will increase the moment arm around the hip and reduce it around the knee, potentially making it a more comfortable option. Furthermore, the split squat or other single leg squat variations can allow you to utilize less overall weight while still achieving the same training stimulus and adaptations at the legs. This is helpful in the cases of low back pain. Let's use a theoretical example. A 200 pound back squat places this weight through the spine and is then distributed equally, roughly 50-50, to each leg, so 100 pounds each. In contrast, the split squat can allow for the same lower body stimulus while reducing the load being placed on the back. For example, a 135 pound split squat places this weight through the spine, 135 pounds, but now let's assume that 75% of the weight is distributed to the lead leg, 100 pounds, and 25% to the back leg, 35 pounds. Therefore, less compressive and shear forces are being experienced by the lumbar spine, while the same stimulus is being directed to the legs. These forces aren't inherently bad as we usually adapt to them over time, but the split squat can be an excellent consideration as an exercise alternative to the squat if the overall load on the back is problematic. These recommendations are for when pain is limiting you from lifting. However, it's worth noting that pain is sometimes okay during rehabilitation, such as with cases of patella tendinopathy. So if you have certain questions pertaining to your particular needs or case, we highly suggest that you seek out a reliable healthcare practitioner for guidance. Now, if you're still watching the video up to this point, I really hope that the information presented was valuable and that you can utilize it to hopefully help you keep squatting even in the presence of pain. Our goal is to convert this information into a PDF or ebook, so be on the lookout for that, as well as future videos kind of like this where we break down different movements and provide a long list of modifications. Our goal is to cover the deadlift, pull up, bench press, and some other movements. If you guys like this video, tap that like button, subscribe, any questions that you might have, drop them in the comments below and we will get back to you. Again, thank you guys for watching. See you later.